My name is Mary Conquest. I'm your host for Safety Labs by Slice, the podcast where we explore the human side of safety to support safety professionals. We move past regulations and reportables to talk about the core skills of safety leadership, empathy, influence, trust, rapport, In other words, the soft skills that help you do the hard stuff. Hi there, welcome to Safety Labs by Slice. What is the link between well-being and workplace safety? How does a person's life outside work contribute to their safety choices at work? What's the role of safety professionals in boosting well-being? Is any of it the company's business? Jason Anker joins me today to talk about all these questions and more surrounding well-being and workplace safety. Jason's story gives him a unique perspective into workplace safety. In 1993, he was injured in a workplace accident that left him paralyzed from the waist down. The result was devastating for Jason and his young family. In the years that followed, Jason became a sought-after inspirational speaker, describing how the fallout from this event led him to rock bottom and how he managed to pick himself up, move forward, and commit to making a difference for others. He's the author of Paralysis to Success, Bouncing Back from Adversity. And in 2015, he was made a member of the British Empire for his contributions to the world of health and safety. Jason is the anchor in UK-based consultancy Anchor and Marsh, which offers expertise on health and well-being, culture change, behavioral change, and inspirational leadership, among other business improvement topics. Jason joins us today from Manchester. Welcome. Welcome, Mary. Thank you for having me on your show. We're looking forward to it. Great. Um, So I'm going to start. For many years, your, your speaking career focused primarily on your accident. You connected with your audiences to help them understand the true cost of a workplace accident and what it takes to move forward from hardship. But more recently, you shifted your focus a little bit to workplace well-being. Can you tell us a bit about why you felt that shift was an important one? I actually started speaking uh, 16 years post my accident. So initially, for probably for the first eight, nine years, I thought by sharing my accident story and the, the impact of my life was enough to change behaviours at work. And then about four years ago, I started to talk about well-being because I was I was very aware because we're talking safety about um, the gut instinct when you believe something's unsafe that you should stop. And what always troubled me about sharing my story, where I'm trying to ask people to stop and speak up, was that without my accident, I can vividly remember stopping, think about the job, realised it was unsafe, and I still did it. And that part of the story is always, you know, the why, why did I do what I did? I know what I did was wrong. I know what I should have spoken up, but I chose to carry on working. And that part of my story is always, it's probably been the bit that's always been missing from a presentation. And then, obviously, you mentioned Tim. Prior to uh, starting our business uh, uh, business together, Tim was a confident. I mean, Tim's you know, Dr. Tim Marsh. He's known globally around the world for his contribution to safety. And he had a conversation with me and just said to me, look, there's more to your story than just an accident story. I think why you chose to do what you did is really, really important, and we need to, we need to share this. And it was sort of Tim's early probes into my story and and look at my well-being at the time of my accident you know how i how i was coming to work i i i even go back to my presentations the year prior to my accident and look at how my life outside work has started to fall apart how that transgresses into what sort of person you become when you're at work and that was really the start so i, I sort of looked at the well-being side of of my accident and then with tim's expertise really helped me shift my presentation and the responses, you know, and I think if anything about the pandemic, what we like to call it, the last couple of years we've all experienced, I think the whole arena of well-being has really come to the front. And so what we were talking about pre-pandemic, some clients were sort of saying to us, yes, we like the sounds of that, but just stick to safety, you know. And I think now we've been so aware that persons because everybody's been affected by this you know some people have lost possibly lost family members or people have lost careers or people have you know long covid or everybody has been affected somehow and so i think a positive to come from this is that well-being is now really really looked at 
And I'm, I'm rightly so. So well-being, just, I just want to make sure that we're clear. It can be understood in a lot of different ways. I, I think most commonly people associate it with mental health, but can you give us a full picture of what you mean when you say well-being? I can't say that my mental health had been affected by the time of my accident. The reason why I was suffering from a mental disorder, because I really wasn't, but my mental state why well, I call it mental well-being there's mental health and mental well-being and my mental well-being was really tested I was I was 24 years old I'd been made redundant at the end of 92 from a job I absolutely loved I was a sign writer I'm very artistic so it was a job I I just got from you know from leaving school the job I, I dreamed of leaving, you know the job I wanted to do I was very fortunate to get an apprenticeship and it, it was like the dream come true. Not necessarily the best paid job in the world, but I, I really loved it. So for me, being made redundant, it was it was just, you know, one of them things happening in life. But also I was suffering from marriage problems, like a young marriage with, with two young children. So debt, a young marriage, losing your job, end up working in jobs that I didn't want to do, so low morale. So, you know, when we talk about mental health and mental well-being for me is, the physical state you come to work in the morning, you know, are you having breakfast? Are you drinking properly? I, you know, I was I was drinking alcohol uh, heavily at the time because my marriage was failing. So going to work in the morning, a little bit hungover, uh, not eating properly, working in jobs I didn't want to do. So my work morale was really poor. And then going back home to the marriage problems at home as well, not sleeping properly. Uh, so these things for me, it's only now I can look back and these things were so visible that was happening to me my you know and i think that we sometimes get a bit lost in the word mental health you know and we just think of people really struggling at the edges either with depression or anxiety or you know bipolar or all these all these sort of recognized conditions but the majority of people are people just with well-being issues it could be marriage problems could be debt issues, could be problems with the children, could be a fatality, could be children in hospital. So I believe that those affect so many people. It's it's just like self Mary, you just, you just mentioned you caught off the back of COVID. You're not you're not yourself, you're not you're not hundred percent. And but we come to work and we, we we give our best, but and people will always try and give their best. But if they're struggling, their best, you know, it, it might be just be barely minimal. I think that's that's the area where we've got to focus because it's it's not just about safety. You know, I think that that's the area we've got to try and get. People talk about safety because we can measure safety, but when we talk about things like production and quality and absenteeism, presenteeism, how much discretionary effort, discretionary effort do you get from a worker who's in a good place or having a bad time at work? So. For me and what Tim has learned me, and it's really understanding that my accident had so much more, it happened for so many more reasons than just making a safety error, ignoring the safety rule. And I think that is like the awakening for me. I was going to ask you actually about, and uh, there's no scientific answer to this, but how much do you think your well-being before your accident? And it sounds like you're talking about sort of struggling that falls short of a, an actual diagnosis, but struggling nonetheless. How much do you think that contributed to it as opposed to other factors like safety procedures on the work site or, yeah, the, the way safety was handled generally on the work site? Yeah, uh, and it's something I, I, I talk about towards the end of my presentations. My accent was a rush job, end of shift lack of planning. There was many factors maybe could have prevented my accident. But because I actually stopped and thought about it, I can't, I've always struggled using those excuses, shall I say, as the reason I had my accident. But I know if I live in a place where I could have spoke how I was feeling, or maybe somebody would have noticed I was I was not myself. I, today, I, I'll say 99% I'm convinced that my well-being on the day of my accident was a significant factor of why I chose to work on safety that day. And I don't think another safety rule or safety procedure would have actually stopped me in that moment not climbing that ladder. The last time we spoke, you uh, you talked about flaws in instant, uh, incident investigation. And here's how you put it. Everybody looks for a broken rule or a broken procedure and yet nobody really looks for a broken person. So can you expand on why it's important then to include that extra realm of information when when we're investigating accidents? Absolutely. You know, 
uh, I mean, Tim's kind of doing an active investigation at, at the moment, and because he know he's about aware of this, it's like taking a couple of steps back from the incident. You know, you, you might see somebody working on safe, or there's been an accident, and we all, like say we always look for that broken rule or broken procedure, but just by maybe asking the person how his life's been over the last couple of weeks, couple of months over the last year and I, I guarantee that nine times out of ten you'll you'll hear something probably answers a lot of the questions you've got about the accident you know i've gone to a lot of sites today and i you know say for example a, a company's got me and speak to the the scaffolders about working at height i mean i go in there and say look you know more about working safely at height than me because you do that as your profession so I'm not going to sit here and go through all the rules and reasons why you should work safely at I. I'm more, I want to talk to you more about why do you choose not to work safely? And nine times out of ten, what I'm getting at the moment and the, the conversation I have a, a, around mental health and well-being, more people talk to me after my presentations about well-being than they do safety. And I think that is the that is the indication for me that this is touching on something different that People are coming to work and, you know, the rules and regulations are always going to be needed. You know, procedures and all these are, 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 are significantly important to working safe. But understanding the impact of someone having a, you no know, having no sleep. You know, I, in fact, I, only last week, a young guy called speaking at the end of my presentations because I, at the end of my presentations, sorry, at the end of my presentations, I basically said to the audience, if anyone's been affected by anything I've said or you want to have a, you know, a private chat with me after the presentations. And a young guy came up to me and said, look, I really like working for this company. He says, this is a really good family company. I've worked here more or less since leaving school. He says, unfortunately, um, my second child um, has just been born. He's quite poorly. He's, you know, it's not long-term, not life-threatening, but he's still in hospital. So I'm looking after the, the other child in between working, in between going to the hospital and seeing my parent, uh, my, my, my partner and the child, he says, I'm not no sleep. He says, I'm absolutely worn out. So all the things you talked about before your accident, in a similar sort of way, even though I've not got marriage problems, I feel I'm in a similar place to what you was, trying to juggle my job, trying to do this, trying to do that. He says, I'm very fortunate. I work for quite a good company. He says, could you, I can't imagine what I'd be doing if I was working in a poor workplace. So that sort of makes me very clear. I think individuals have a massive responsibility to look after their own well-being, you know, by doing things like um, what they eat, what they drink, keeping hydrated, sleep. We also believe that the companies themselves have a responsibility to make sure that workers come to work and work in a good environment. So for me, there's two sides to this, the work for themselves and the company themselves playing their, their role. I'd like to talk about both of those. Um, but just as you mentioned that um, people come up to you after, I'm curious, do you think people, first of all, do people put up their hand and share these stories publicly or do you find that it's mostly people coming up afterwards to have a more private chat? Great question. Great question. The latter, yeah, people, we're still in this space. I mean, I, I'm speaking from the UK and, you know, I, I think you know, most people say British are quite reserved and people aren't still, even though there's more awareness around mental health and well-being in the workplace people are still very very reluctant to speak up i try and speak to the audience that it, it, it's the person you know the leader the supervisor the, the the manager if they could come forward and share a story about their mental health issues it creates that environment where it's okay to speak about it you, you're probably not aware over the weekend there was a ufc fight with a fighter from, from the uk it's, it's quite brash. He's, he's very likable, but he's a real. He's from Liverpool. He's a cheeky chap, and but he's very he's very good at fighting, and and he won his fight. And straight away afterwards, as he was doing the interview, he just said he went on this thing and said, "Look, my friend, unfortunately, committed suicide. He got a call at four in the morning. I dedicate my fight to him." But then he went on to talk about mental health and speaking up. You know, he says it, it. it's not a weakness to speak up, it's a strength. And you give a present, you know, he spoke in the ring for just a couple of moments, a couple of minutes. Well, the impact that's in the UK over the weekend and even now, because he's a rough and tumble fighter, but he spoke about his own mental health as well. 
So I think that, uh, one of the one of the charities, one of the men's mental health charities, have had a fifty percent increase in people coming forward. So the answer to your question is, it is difficult to speak up, and I think it's really vital that the people who have confidence and who appear strong, um, if they can share their own stories around mental health, and you know, I'd, uh, it's that phrase that break the stigma. And it, it, you know, I think sometimes we hear it so many times, it loses loses a bit of power. But it's it's all about that, isn't it? It's all about the more we speak openly about this and make it just a normal conversation, a normal thing to speak about the football, the soccer, the, the things you want to be fun at the weekend, and then just you know, I've I've had a bad weekend. Oh, what's the problem? We we tend to shy away from those conversations, and, and but unfortunately, when when something bad does happen, we all then say, "Oh yes, I knew something wasn't right." So it's like we're behind, aren't we? We we are still in a place, I think, where we 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 are reacting to mental health and mental and well being. We need to be more proactive. Let's talk now about um, sort of responsibility. How do you see it? There's obviously there's some individual responsibility there's some organizational responsibility let's start with individuals how much of a person's well-being would you say is their personal responsibility i struggled with my mental health 25 years after my accident and i tried to hide it i didn't i didn't tell a soul i used alcohol i wasn't an alcoholic but i'd go out on a weekend and i I drink far too much mainly to get me i was anxious my anxiety levels it was anxiety i suffered mainly um so going out to a bar I'd be anxious about my wheelchair, so I'd pre-drink before I went out. I'd get out, I'd, I'd be nervous, I'd be, you know, I've got accessible toilets, was it access, would I get in even? So all these anxieties are following me around. So then I'd go out, and because I was anxious, I'd drink far too much. And then I'd obviously make probably a bit of a fool of myself. And the next day, full of, full of guilt and anxiety, because you've done it again, you've drank too much, so I'd start skipping meals, so... My sleep pattern was all over the place. I could never have sleep. I've tried so many things uh, over the years to try and help help myself. But I'll say the turning point, you, me- you mentioned writing the book, and I had a ghostwriter help me write the book. That process of writing the book was really difficult because I, I had to start to speak about how I was really feeling. So all the, all the things I'd hidden for so long came out in the book. And it was, it was like for the first time realising that speaking up about how he was feeling and, and I got, you know, a lot of people after the book came out read it and said, we never knew. We never knew you were struggling at the time. If only we knew, you know. And I think from me speaking up about how I was feeling was probably the first big turning point in my life. You know, so from the individual, what I've done now, I always say there's no one big thing that changes you. It's, it's the series of small things. And the small things can be really, really small, but you practice these things over and over again. And then the next one comes along and these little things just start to add up a little bit. So the first one I did for my, for, for my anxiety was learning how to breathe properly. It, so, it sounds, it sounds, it, learn how to breathe. I think well, everyone breathes all the time, but when you when you actually look at how how you do breathe, you know, with anxiety, you take short breaths anyway, but learning to breathe properly when you get anxious. I mean, everyone knows when you get mental bad, what do you always say? Take a deep breath. So we know we know these things work, but now I, I get up in the morning, I do my breathing exercises every morning, and then during the day, if I notice anything sort of unsettling me a little bit, just calm myself down, take some deep breaths. Uh, that went into my diet. It went into drinking more water. I've stopped drinking alcohol completely. I'm not an anti-drinker, anti-alcohol person, but for me personally, the realisation between my bad sleep, anxiety, and alcohol. So two Christmases ago, I, I stopped drinking alcohol. I, I'm still on it. And for the first time, I feel like it was like my head's clear. I'm sleeping better, so I'm less fatigued. So I'm with, I'm not tired all the time, making better decisions, uh, lost some weight. So all these things slowly set up. And it, it, it's probably a bit the last three years. You know, it wasn't overnight. Now I'm in a place, I think I'm the best place I've been mentally since my accident, if not before, but definitely since my accident, I'm now in a better place. And, you, you know, go back over what you've asked me before. I believe if my accident happened, you know, if I was the person I am today with the things I do for my well-being, look after my well-being, would I have spoken up on that day? I, I'll say, yes, I would have, spoke, I would have spoken up. I'll take it a stage further. I would not have even been doing that job. I would have walked off some weeks before it even happened. This shows to me that by looking after your own well-being, I practice gratitude 
every single day, look after my well-being, not meditation as such, but I'm bre- I've got some breathing exercises that are very similar to meditating. And But other people are noticing as well now. So it's not just me thinking I'm better, it's other people noticing there's been a big change in me. It sounds like it's, practically speaking, it's a bunch of small habits, but really the big picture is that it's the habit of taking care of yourself. I, I couldn't wear any better. And, and that's it, it's taking care of myself. Taking care of myself physically, you know, the things like a bit of exercise, drinking more water, but also mentally as well. I think I, I spend time, you know, we look after your physical health. People say, oh, yeah, I do this for physical health. How many people actually take their time to look after their own mental health as well? And I think that is so, it's so important in learning how to uncut your mind, how to calm your mind. You know, that's all part of not sleeping properly. You know, I've learned ways now that when when, when my mind is really racing around and just to notice where it is, and a lot of the time I've, I've drifted into the future again. I'm worrying about things that not uh, not even happened. And to stay in the present moment is, is so calming, just to stay in the present. And yeah, it has taken a little bit of time and I've not lost any friendships over this, but I don't mix in circles I used to mix in all of the time because they're still in a mindset Set that doesn't doesn't help my mindset so still my friends i still pop and see them all you know pop and see them but I, i'm not into the the things i was doing before because learning learn how to look after your mind is like it's like it's why you say practice gratitude it's because you're always practicing it it's not something you do for a short period of time uh, i must admit like being on a diet or eating healthy you may lose weight while you're doing it it's, but it's when you stop the weight goes back on so you can back, you talk about your mental health all these things to do to look after your mind are a constant you can't go so so far then stop and think everything's going to be fine so yeah on that side I think that, that's what it is it's, yeah. yeah it's pra- practice 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 practice, practice, yeah. practice, practice. A- absolutely yeah. yeah you know I think people are working on speaking up and and more people because of COVID realize the importance of well-being but there there is still a bit of a stigma it's it's considered a private matter so when an organization wants to start taking care of their employees or being aware of of, of their mental well-being is there a risk that organizations could overstep the the bounds of privacy in trying to learn or improve worker well-being and if so how how can they do it in such a way that that yeah um won't happen that is one of those i call reasons why people are still scared around mental health they'll put the i I call it like a barrier i'm not doing that because if i do that it might get to hr I might, I might lose a promotion, all these. And I, I think, you know, initially th- there may be some instances where it seems like this is not going to work or this is probably the wrong way to go because there may be a, it's like the safety story, isn't there? There's always that story somewhere where somebody raised a safety concern and got sacked. We don't know if it really did happen. It's an urban myth, but that gets mentioned, doesn't it? I'm sure the same thing is going to be be put out there about our mental health and again it goes back the more we can speak up the more senior people of an organization can normalize this conversation around mental health but it's not stigma in fact you know if someone comes forward with a, a mental health issue it shouldn't be something that knocks their career back if anything it should actually expand their career forward because You've got somebody in your organization who's confident enough to come forward and tell you a problem because just by not sharing that problem doesn't make the problem not there. And that person then might may get promoted into a position where they can't handle. You know, good work is good for everybody. You know, it's that saying, good work is good for you. So people in a lot of careers do not get paid for having time off work. So the old thing about people, oh, we'll lose like, so many staff to mental health and people won't be going to work. No. People at the moment are coming to work with mental health issues. That that is fact. You know, and, and these people with, with health issue, mental health issues, you know, might not be as productive because they they're coming to work and doing the best they can possibly do in that moment. But are they more prone to making a mistake? Are they more prone to not speaking up about a safety concern? Are they more prone to still think I've got so much off in my mind at the moment, you know, I can see somebody else doing something wrong, or my energy is going on into me doing my stuff. So I so again, not quoting stats. I'm not, I'm not a big stat- statistician on all, all, all this, but I think it's, companies are, are scared that the well-being aspect is going to cost money. But actually, it's the opposite. The amount of money you will gain by looking after your workforce, staff retention, increased production, increased quality. Safety is actually a byproduct of all this because if we get all these things right, the well-being right and workers are quality. It, it's something I said only this week, actually, on a presentation. Anybody who knows me, my presentations change all the time. I hear something or I come on a show like this, I 
I, I hear a comment and it stays in my mind a little bit. And somebody said that a lot of CEOs will get on stage at the annual conference and without, you know, few exceptions, will, it's first time a comment would be safety is our number one priority. And yet there's people in the audience thinking, if you only you knew what I was doing last week, you want me to say, it, I, I got away with it. But for me, it should be people first. People should be first. Because if people come first, you look after well-being, you, you look after... All, all these other things and if you've got your safety safety should be a byproduct good safety should be a byproduct of coming to work having a good day at work why well, I, I can come to work in the morning and I, I speak about for so many people companies will say our number one priority is that people go home in the same way they arrive in the morning what if we could create a workplace where people feel valued where people feel part of the team and they could come to work maybe after a bad weekend at home with their family or for whatever reason come to work have a really really good day at work and actually go home better than they arrived in the morning yeah i mean that would be it would be wonderful and for organizations who who see the value like there's always going to be some that don't see the value and they'll, they will show themselves through their actions. But for, for ones that do see the value in that, there's certain things that they can't control. They can't control how much a worker sleeps or if they eat in a healthy way or not. So what, what do you think they can do? Like where, practically speaking, what can organizations do to lift up their employees? Yeah, okay. So um, I always, I, I'm quite fortunate to work a lot of, lot of the big clients and some of these modern young companies, you know, the Googles, the Facebooks, uh, with the young staff, they, they're all aware of this. So, you know, you go into some of these offices of, of some of these companies and some of the rooms some of the floors of the office suites are very, very similar probably to a nightclub. You know, they've got chill out areas because they've realized that we've got young people working for us. And I don't know which client it was. I went into the office and I said, this, this, I actually said the words, this looks very similar to me, like a nightclub. He says, but we have to do this. If we want to attract the people we need to attract today, we need to do these things. However, what we found is that you can work somebody for eight hours behind a desk and making sure they don't leave a desk only for breaks. But if we give them the flexibility to do their work and yet if they're feeling tired, there's even sleeping pods in some of these buildings where they could go and have a half an hour sleep. He said our production levels are higher than what they were if we would stand over them for eight hours. So I think you're right. It is the young modern companies of today who recognise you know, I went to a, one, a guy presenting uh, after me, uh, just before me, was talking about lighting and plants. And I thought, when he's nine come aboard, I thought, this this presentation's what's going on. Yet by the end of it, suddenly realising that the impact of the, the environment has on the workforce is quite eye-opening. You know, and I think we need to appreciate that the older companies in their old ways are getting what they've always got. You know, you, you just get what you always get. And yet the new companies are trying to do something different and, and actually wanting staff to remain with them. They don't want staff to leave and be recruiting all the time. They want the staff to, to come to get someone to stay within the company today. It's not all about pay. Pay is always going to be important. But if that's all you've got for someone working for your company, as soon as somebody offers more money, that person will leave. But if you can create an environment where people actually enjoy coming to work, they pay, they feel fairly paid for the work they do, yet they have a really, really good day at work, it's just a win-win. So they go home happy, have a happy weekend, come back to work for the following week, rearing to go. So there's no, it's just realising that, that side of look after your staff and the value that can bring your staff is unbelievable. Yeah, and and as you're pointing out, it makes business sense too. So last time we spoke, you said something really powerful about what might have prevented your accident. You've done a lot of thinking about this and you say that the signs that you weren't in a good place were fairly obvious. Do you remember what's the one thing you feel that might have changed your choice that day? I can tell you what you told me. <laughs> yeah, I will do. So I probably mean, it's, it's probably to ask him if I was okay. Because people knew that the sad thing was it was a day after my accident that other people who was working there came forward. And I started sharing, oh, I think he's having problems with his marriage. I think he's drinking far too much. This isn't right. That isn't right. But they didn't speak about that till the day after my accident. So there's a couple of ways of looking at this. I had a responsibility of speaking up. Obviously, because mental health, 
29 years ago wasn't really talked about however other people recognized i was on the so for whatever reason it was people knew i wasn't myself it wasn't just that day it was probably for, for a good month prior to my accident i didn't see myself i had christmas coming up i had no money so all marriage problems i was bringing these problems to work not sharing it with, any, with anybody and yet other workers had recognized there'd been a change in my behavior i bring that up too because you, we're talking about what organizations can do and you said that you get the sense that some organizations feel that it's costly, like that they have to put in these elaborate well-being programs when really asking someone, how are you doing, is free. <laughs> without a doubt. Um, without a doubt. How you, the problem of asking someone if they're okay, and that's it, is everybody, especially when we talk about in the UK, but it's probably a global thing. If someone asks you if you're okay, the normal response everybody gets is, I'm fine. It's, it's just what people say, how are you today? I'm fine. It, but it's the second time you ask that question. Now, you don't see me say, well, are you sure you're okay? And you might get some people who crack straight away, but no, I'm all right. I mean, but body language changed a little bit. No, come on, let's go for a cup of tea. Let's go for a cup of tea. You, you, you'll find, if it's not the second time you ask, on the third time, people normally crack. And then they'll tell you, what is actually going on so yeah i think that that's the thing the law of i'm fine as tim marsh pens it it's law if someone asks you if, by law if you don't say i'm fine is your response you can get arrested and it's a great joke on stage but he's very serious what he said the law of i'm fine and we're all we're all we're all so guilty of it you know we, we find it very difficult to even if we're really really struggling if someone asks you are you how are you today you know sound fine and people and some people have asked that question not wanting an answer apart from I'm fine. Yeah, I think I think that's the kernel, that's the core, and that's why asking it the second time is what cracks, or third, is what cracks them, is because they realize, oh, you really want to know. You actually want to know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, it's a quiet thing. You know, you know, and what, we, what we see at the moment is... Um, that's where the training around mental health, mental well-being, and all the stuff sort of we do is learning to to want to know the answer. You can ask how are you in a way that you might say to the person. Don't say anything else apart from you're fine. And then when something goes wrong, you you, you fundamentally find them and say, well, I asked them if it's okay. And you say everything was fine. So yeah, the, the, and there are always going to be people out there that do that. But if we if we really want to move forward around mental health, is we need to learn how to have those conversations. And if someone comes back and says, no, actually, I'm not fine, is, is what, what we do next. There are a few questions I ask every guest. The first one, I'm going to call this the University of Jason. <laughs> So if you were asked to develop a curriculum to teach soft skills to future safety professionals, where do you think you would focus? Communication. I think it's all what we've talked about all the evening on the podcast of all the things that may or may not be to my accident may not have speaking learning how to communicate you know fairly if you're a manager you know there's there's ways you have to talk to your staff there's ways you have to create morale all, all these things so communication is absolutely massive and learning how to I always say we need to learn how to speak and we need to, the biggest thing we need to do is learn how to listen you know we're, we're very good at we're very good at talking um i can ramble on and on for hours and i've been accused of it before and one thing i'm learning for myself on some of the coaching i have is learn how to listen learn how to pause so when you've asked a question are you are you listening to the reply or are you waiting for an opportunity to speak here and i think that you know, with closed listening so you've asked the question for so you're not really listening to his answer all you're actually doing is, is waiting for a pause while they're speaking so you can start speaking again. So obviously well-being is, is a thing that, you know, I'm trying to champion at the moment. But I, I like to say, it's really like, I think communication, because if we can learn how to communicate with people, that means we can we can more open about how I'm actually feeling. So it goes back to your previous statement, how are you today? Well, actually, I'm okay. However... This happen or that. So, do you just understand how quickly that this, this could sort of build? You know, I don't think this is this big scary monster that people think it is. I think it's looking this, looking from this from a slightly different viewpoint. That if we can communicate better about how we're feeling, I think we, we work safer as default. Uh, we work smarter, so companies can generate more profit. And, you know, quality wouldn't be an issue. So, yeah, the champion, champion uh, around, around communication that, that we can speak openly, you know, and I think that's that would be that be quite amazing and achieve so much as well. Yeah, and I think um, it, it goes well with what you're saying about asking, as you said, how are you doing and listening to the answer because there's a big difference between I'm fine and I'm fine. 
<laughs> you know, and that's part of communication is listening to tone and, and that sort of thing. Which which, which leads on to, we, we're losing a lot of communication skills because of things like text messages. And I just said, a text message, how are you today? I'm fine. How do you, how do you read it? Do you read any body language? No. So again, I think the whole thing is actually face to face asking someone, are they okay? And sending the, the, you know, the, the email or the text message, how are you? Because I'm fine. How can we start to learn that someone's not quite right or, or not feeling themselves just by sending text messages or emails? Yeah, it gets, it gets rid of the tone, which is a huge part of it. So the next question is if, and this might seem obvious, but uh, if you could travel back in time and speak to yourself at the beginning of your career, so not necessarily about the accident, and you could give yourself only one piece of advice, what would it be? Probably be more confident because I, I wasn't a confident person anyway. You know, leaving school, didn't do great in my exams. I, I was very quite quite shy, not very open to speaking up um, about anything you know, as a as young person. And it's only now that I'm doing what I've done. I'm actually being a lot more confident when I, when I speak to people. You know, if something's not right or something, I disagree with something, instead of just agreeing blindly, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll tell people, so I'm 54 now, so I'd say for the last sort of um, getting on for 40 years, I've been very good at not being confident, <laughs> I've been a master of it. So being more confident, which leads back into the accident. If I'd been more confident, would I have spoken up that day? So, you know, this this is, you know, go, it's actually, are you okay? If you're not very confident, you're probably, I'm fine. But if you're a confident person, you say, probably, I'm fine, however... So for me, confidence would be a, would have been a big change through my life and through through the recovery of my accident as well. So you've written a book about your story, and I'm sure that listeners will want to look that up. Are there any other resources that you recommend that you think are really helpful to learn about the role of well-being in workplace safety? I'll plug Tim Marsh's latest book as well. Um, obviously, it, it, an issue was health and safety, and he wrote it. I think he's, he's done another edition at the moment, actually, but you know, health, safety, and well-being, and looking at that role, that taking that holistic approach to health, safety, and well-being. Obviously, my book is just a a, um, a story of my accident and my life, where it's done a lot more in depth. Personally, now, I just read anything that boosts me, you know, anything to do with um, positivity, anything like that, because it's not just in your own personal life. Anything you learn around positivity and improving your own, uh, own life can be pushed into the workplace and, and shared with colleagues. So where can our listeners find you on the web? www.anchormarsh.com. My daughter has um, the, the, the motivational speaking side of Anchor and Marsh, uh, Proud to be Safe. That's www.anchormarsh.com ptbs.org where she's got a list of of speakers you know survivors of accidents and people involved with accidents her wall now have moved the story into the well-being arena as well looking at their accidents from their own well-being point of view as well but the anchor and marsh is, is the main site okay and we'll have that in the notes um by the way but anchor is spelled a-n-k-e-r so that's all the time we have for today Thanks to our listeners for your support and a big thank you to Jason for sharing your hard-earned wisdom. Oh, thank you very much. Very enjoyed it, Mary. Thank you. Um, and the last thanks go go to the Safety Labs by Slice team who care about and support each other so we can all do our best work. Bye for now. Safety Labs is created by Slice, the only safety knife on the market with a finger-friendly blade. Find us at sliceproducts.com. Until next time, stay safe.